Let's not swap beers. All right? Let's not swap beers. All right, so we ready to go? Where's Tommy? Where's Tommy? Tom, you all set? Oh, Tommy's over there. Okay. What, well, are you going to kick off? I will. Okay. So we've got some feedback issues, I think, guys. We're okay? No, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the formally, in the formal sense, the Peach Tree Hotel. But if you're a local, you know it's the Peachy. Thank you all very much for being here tonight. And uh, it's always a great pleasure to welcome the Prime Minister to our community. PM, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Can I welcome all of our guests who, uh, as far as I can tell, come from far and wide across the community, from business, from community organisations, from educational institutions, and uh, people who just wanted to respond and chew the fat with the Prime Minister post the budget. And this is a great opportunity for a Politics in the Pub event. Some of you have been to Politics in the Pub events with us at the Peachy before. This is a very special opportunity to be live streamed on the Prime Minister's Facebook site. And if you do happen to be watching at home on Facebook, then please drop your questions there at the bottom of the page and uh, we'll do our best to, uh, to come to those. We have had a fabulous afternoon here in Penrith today. Okay. We have visited Nigel McKinley and his wife Renee and their, uh, their family and his partner Tim at Up Hire and Innovate on Mulgoa Road there at Jamison Town. You probably all drive past it uh, every day of the week. There at Jamison Town, they are supporting road work safety across New South Wales. They are supporting innovative technology to deliver really important um, engagement with our infrastructure packages across the region. And you all know how much is being done from the New South Wales and the Commonwealth perspective in that regard. And it's a great example of a business in our community which has grown, moved to new premises, innovated, developed, take adv taken advantage of the instant ad asset write-off, all of those opportunities. And the message that Nigel McKinley sent to us today was that he wants to do more. He's and that's exactly more. the sort of business that we know thrives in Penrith, thrives in Lindsay, and thrives across Western Sydney. So PM, welcome to you. Enjoy meeting all of our friends and, who are, and community members who are here tonight. Enjoy meeting the people who've come to chew the fat with you, and I look forward to participating as well. Welcome. Well, well, thanks very much, Maurice, and it is, it is great to be here. And, you know, we've had a, a budget which uh, embodies in its objectives the spirit of this community, which is one of enterprise. We have a budget which is delivering on the promises we made in 2016, promises to ensure that we had stronger economic growth because that enables everything. You know, this is not... I'm not trying to uh, read a page out of an economics textbook. Uh, too late in my career to go back to that. What we're talking about is ensuring that we have the opportunities for Australians to get ahead and realise their dreams. Whether that is with a career, working for the government or working for a big company or working in the Defence Force. Uh, we have our very capable Minister for Defence standing next to me here. And Maurice Payne, she, she is the Senator for Western Sydney, but she's also a fantastic Minister for Defence. And I was always say, always feel safer when I see you on television Thank there, Maurice. <laughs> Give me a real sense of reassurance. <laughs> but you know, we've got all of those opportunities. And above all, we're seeking to ensure that people have the confidence to invest and employ. And then 2016, I went around the country, as did Maurice, talking about the importance of jobs and growth. Well, last year, we had record jobs growth in our history, 415,000 jobs, the most jobs ever created in Australia's history. And right now, we're seeing over 1,000 jobs a day created. That's a big deal. How do we maintain that? How do we maintain that stronger economic growth? Because that enables us to spend record amounts on schools, on infrastructure, $75 billion over the next 10 years, massive investment in infrastructure here in Western Sydney, as you know, and we can talk about that in some detail. How does it enable us to ensure that our defence force has the capabilities and the equipment it needs to keep us safe in a 
in a, in a riskier and more challenging world, uh, perhaps, than we had a couple of decades ago? How do we ensure we have the resources to keep our airports safe, to make the investments to harden up our security in the face of the threats from terrorism, which we'd had some tragic reminders uh, today, just uh, with the attacks in Indonesia and, of course, in France. How do we afford to do all of that? A stronger economy is the key. And so that's what, that's what we have set out to do. We set out an economic plan in 2016 and we are delivering on it. A big part of that, of course, is bringing the budget back into balance. We inherited a huge deficit from the Labor Party, which has been very hard to turn around. In 2019-20, the budget will come back into balance and it'll go, then go into larger surpluses in the years ahead. This current financial year, the net debt of the Commonwealth of Australia, the federal government, will peak as a share of GDP and then it will start to come down. And by, in 10 years' time, it'll be about current, this year it'll peak at 18.6% of GDP, of the, essentially the size of the economy. Uh, in 10 years' time, it'll be 3.8% of GDP. Very, very different. How have we done that? Well, we've achieved, despite what everyone said about the Senate being um, uh, mm. impossible to work with, we've worked with the Senate, treated everyone in the Senate with respect, regardless of which party they've come from. We've succeeded in getting $41 billion of savings through the Senate. We've managed to secure uh, tax cuts for small and medium businesses, up to $50 million turnover, like the business we are with today, uh, Innovate. And, uh, and that is a company of, of which there are th thousands uh, across Australia and indeed across Western Sydney. Uh, which are investing and are hiring and are creating jobs. You know, we've succeeded in getting tax cuts for businesses under $50 million turnover, and we want to do more so that we can be more competitive. Uh, but those businesses, which are not huge businesses uh, by any means, they employ more than half of all Australians in the private sector. So. Don't, you know, when people talk about small businesses and medium businesses and family businesses, that is the engine room of the Australian economy. And we're backing them. We're backing them with the 20, we're just talking about it with one of our guests here tonight, the $20,000 instant asset write-off for small businesses under $10 million turnover. All of this has supported this stronger growth in jobs. And at the same time, we've been able to bring tax relief for hard-working Australian families. We think it's, it's so important that hard-working Australian families who have not been getting the sort of wa regular wage increases in real terms uh, that we used to in years past see are able to keep more of the money they've earned. So in our seven-year personal income tax reform plan, we're seeing in the first stage from next year we'll see 10 million Australians, taxpayers, will get a, get a tax refund. Four million of them, a bit more actually, will get $530 and the rest will get uh, mostly a, a bit less than that. But that, that is going to then roll into a reform which we'll see at the end of the seven years, this outcome, where you'll pay at from $41,000, pay after the tax free threshold, uh, you'll get up after a, a bit over $18,000. You'll pay 19 cents in the dollar tax, and at $41,000, it's 32 and a half cents for every additional dollar, all the way up to $200,000, and then 45 cents in the dollar, plus, of course, the Medicare levy after that. So, what that means is that you will know, for 94% of Australians will know, that they, if they work harder, if they get a, and longer, or they get some overtime, they get a promotion, they get a new job, their business does better, it makes them more money than it had done in the past, they know that they will not be moving into higher and higher tax brackets until they get up to $200,000. That is a huge reform. And what does that do? That provides encouragement, it provides support, it, it provides the long-term vision that you need, which says to enterprising Australians, 
to hard-working Australians, we are backing you. And we're backing you because we know that you are the ones that deliver the stronger economy. Polit all politicians can do is create the rules and the environment and make strategic investments. But above all, our strong economy depends on the enterprise of hard-working Australians. We have to keep Australians safe. We have to make sure that the tax laws provide the right incentives. We have to make sure that everyone pays their tax. And we've made a lot of reforms there in that area, whether it's about the cash economy or multinationals. We can come to that in a minute if you're, if you're interested in further detail. But above all, we've got to back hard-working, enterprising Australians. Hard-working Australians, whether they're in business, whether they're working as employees for a larger firm or a smaller firm, or whether in the public sector. We want people to be able to get ahead and plan ahead and realise their dreams. That's what our budget does. So it ensures hard-working Australian families can keep more of what they earn. It provides businesses the incentives to invest and employ. It delivers the infrastructure and the essential services that we need with increasing funding every year. Those people who say, like they do in the Labor Party, that we're cutting funding to schools and hospitals, that is completely untrue. And I've brought the budget papers here. If anyone wants to challenge me on it, I can read you chapter and verse. Uh, and of course, we're bringing the budget back into balance, which is important. Uh, as, you know, we, as we know we cannot keep on building up a mountain of debt to throw onto the shoulders of our children and grandchildren. So it's a good budget. It's delivered on our commitments to back enterprise, to back financial and economic responsibility. And I'm really pleased to be here tonight with you and look forward to discussing it with you. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> thank, you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. And uh, some of the Facebook questions are, are rolling in. Uh, I'm getting some of those on my phone. But why don't we start with uh, questions in the room? Lady here. And we do have a roving mic, so just hang on till that comes to you. My name's Jocelyn. I'm a registered nurse in aged care. There is extensive research here in Australia and internationally that increased ratios of registered nurses reduces mortality and enhances positive care outcomes. However, there appears to be government intent to ignore this evidence and continue to placate providers by upskilling cheaper, unlicensed care workers and extend industry-led self-regulation in favor of mandating safe staffing and skills mix in aged care. This seems to be business as usual. Given the recent media exposure of abuse in aged care and the failure of the quality agency to regulate the aged care sector, sorry, um, to, sorry, and the failure of the quality agency to regulate the aged care sector effectively, how will you ensure that our older Australians will have access to the right number and skills mix of workers in residential aged care facilities to keep them safe? You did say, keep Australians safe. Well, what about our older Australians well, in aged care facilities? Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for that. That's a great, a great question. And you will have heard our, our aged care uh, minister, uh, Ken Wyatt, talk about this. Uh, we've had the budget is a great budget for older Australians. And there's a, there's a bunch of uh, elements to that. Firstly, on the issue of maintaining and uh, ensuring that quality is met, we're setting up a new agency to make sure that the rules are complied with. And, uh, you know, Ken, as you will have seen Ken uh, in the media being... Uh, very forceful, forthright about that. So, so the the you know in instances of neglect, uh, even uh, abuse, uh, we will not tolerate them. So I can assure you, we're uh, we're cracking down on that. In terms of choice, we're ensuring that older Australians have more options to get uh, home care packages, so they can get support in their old age uh, in home. Which you know, because most Australians, most people when they're getting older and frailer, would rather, would rather be at home than be uh, in, a, uh, you know, in an aged care uh, in, you know, for facility. Uh, so they'd rather be at home, We're providing more care there. We're also ensuring that older Australians can earn more without, imp uh, without impacting 
on their pension entitlement so they can earn an extra $50 a fortnight without impacting on the pension. Uh, that's just one of many changes that we've made. But, I, but we recognise, absolutely, that we need to provide older Australians with the security, you mentioned that, uh, with the respect and the support that all of their years of creating the amazing country that we live in today entitles them to. So thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Jocelyn. And just, uh, just one Facebook question very quickly. Anthony asks, I think there's going to be two answers to this question in this room. Anthony asks, how many Sydney teens will beat the Melbourne storm? I'm reasonably <laughs> confident that the uh, most uh, uh, vociferous answer in this room will be Panthers, but I suspect the man on my right is going to say Roosters as yeah, well. Yeah, that's West. right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to vote for Wests over here. <laughs> right. Another question from the floor. Gentleman over by the bar. Um, will the budget for higher income earners get a uh, better break than the lower income earners? If you choose to now, like for the future, that might um, uh, the tax free threshold, right? What is that? 19,000. Yeah, any chance of lifting the tax free threshold from 19, say, for a higher rate? Well, yeah, let me uh, make a, just one, one observation. Remember, the tax free threshold benefits every taxpayer. So, so it's not just there is a, there is a LITO that obviously. Uh, increases that for people on, on, on lower incomes, but uh, in terms of the tax-free threshold itself, everyone gets a benef benefit of it, whether they're on $40,000 or $400,000. So that's one of the costs of uh, moving the tax-free threshold up. But let me just uh, make this response to the question. Our tax system is a progressive one, by which means that people on higher incomes pay a larger share of tax. Income tax is paid, the bulk of it is paid by the few, not the many. Now, after our reforms, in two, seven years from now, when it's all complete, a person on $205,000, which is five times as much as $41,000, will pay 13 times as much tax. 13 times as much tax. So that is, remains a very progressive system. And in fact, the people in 24-25, the people in the 45 cent in the dollar tax bracket, which by that stage will be over 200,000, it's currently over 180,000 now, will pay a larger percentage of income tax, the total income tax take, uh, than they do today. So the, the income tax system remains progressive, the tax, the bulk of it will be paid by the few, not the many. Uh, the, the people on higher incomes will pay a, a, a much higher share of tax than people on lower incomes. Uh, but the important thing about the reform is that provides that real incentive for 94% of the population that are not earning over $200,000, provides that real incentive for them to get ahead, to know that if they work some overtime, if they get a better job, get a promotion, start a business that does well, they're not going to be hit you know, every time they raise their income with yet another high rate of income tax. So that's, this is all about incentive, it's about enterprise, it's about a stronger economy, because you know, upon that, that's the rock upon which everything else depends, stronger economy. Thank you. There's a question over here, gentlemen, with a shirt, uh, green shirt, and there's a microphone beside you. One, two. Prime Minister, I uh, happen to think that uh, the National School Chaplaincy Program is a fantastic program. I work as a chaplain just five kilometres in that direction with a bunch of kids, five to 12 year olds in a public school who are really disadvantaged, uh, really struggling and uh, in a budget that uh, speaks a lot about economies and uh, uh, jobs, as important as that is, social yep. welfare is uh, so important. So it's not a question, it's a comment, it's a thank you for investing yep. in the children and uh, continuing that program for four years. Well, uh, thank very you. Very much appreciated. Thanks very much. Thank you. And, uh, and we're, well, we're, we're continuing it, uh, you know, in, indefinitely. So it's, uh, it'll be, hopefully, it'll be part of the, the uh, school's landscape 20, 30 years from now. Thank you very much. And there's a question, um, there's an arm over there belonging to a lady, I can see that much. Um, 
Sure, the lady in the blue, in the blue shirt. Uh, if you just wait for the microphone and perhaps let us know where you're from, as that gentleman did, that's very helpful. And then after you, we'll go to one more Facebook question. We'll come back to the room after that. Um, well, thank you for coming out tonight is the first thing. Um, my name is Jessica and I'm from Penrith. Um, my question is in relation to mental illness. Yeah. So, um, although we have come a long way in regards to understanding and treating mental illness, there is still a long way to go. Kids as young as 16 and even younger are being admitted into adult psychiatric wards and left to fend for themselves. They are forced to carry around hairbrushes or any other of the few items they have access to to fend off old, very unwell men, being so scared that they have to hide, in, hide out in their room for hours or days at a time. Patients, including children, are subjected to frisk and strip searches, being locked in seclusion for hours with nothing but a mattress and sometimes being naked, being over-sedated and being threatened with being knocked out by injection. Patients, including children, are cable tied or restrained to beds with no access to a call button for hours or even days at a time. Public site wards can often make patients worse, or usually, as usually there is no programs, nothing stimulating to do, no phones or internet, no safe place, limited privacy, limited visitors and visiting hours. They should, they should be a place for patients to get help, have some downtime, recover and learn some new coping skills. Instead, of pa instead patients are scared, bored out of their minds, going stir crazy and begging their psychiatrists and nurses to be discharged to get out of a hellhole that the government thinks that is the, is the solution to helping them. Nurses and doctors can make situations worse by escalating them instead of de-escalating them, resulting in patients being restrained or sedated when all they needed to do was speak to them like normal people instead of with contempt. Stigma and lack of understanding and training is still running rampant in the staff and hospitals in Australia. People who are desperate and crying out for help are being turned away from emergency departments, either due to the continued stigma or no beds. Some of those discharged leave the emergency room, commit suicide or severely injure themselves. To offer somebody who is in a complete state of deep depression and hopelessness, absolutely no treatment at all or, or extremely little is a national disgrace. Suicide continues to be on the rise, especially in our young population and those with mental illness and those who kill themselves are getting younger and younger. I recently went to my first funeral for a girl who I went to school with. She was only 20. She killed herself, a tragedy that should never have happened, especially to someone who had such a bright future with her whole life ahead of her. Currently, people are offered 10 free psychologist visits a year. This is less than one session a month. Nobody with mental illness is gonna make any progress with such little therapy. People would rather commit suicide than go into public psych wards in Australia. I personally spoken to numerous people who have been in both jail and a public psychiatric ward. Every single one of them said that jail. Pat McGorry, the two leading psychiatrists in Australia, uh, Ian's at uh, Sydney University, and uh, he's got a great, a great concept. He talks about the mental wealth of nations. You know, Adam Smith, the 18th century economist, talked about the wealth of nations. Ian said, talks about the mental wealth of nations, and he reminds us that we all have a vested interest in everybody else's mental health. And that's why it's so important to say to a friend, a workmate, who is, seems distracted or unhappy, how are you going? Take an interest in them. Take an interest in the people that we're close to, that we love, and make sure that we draw them in to show them some love. I mean, remember, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the extraordinary uh, uh, example of Don Ritchie, you know, the old, it, it was an old man when he, when he died, of course, but uh, he was uh, a guy who lived uh, near the Gap in, uh, in my electorate in, in Wentworth, in, uh, in Sydney. Uh, that is uh, a place where more people choose to kill themselves than anywhere else in Australia. It is, as they call it, a suicide hotspot. And he used to go and walk up and down there in for his walks as an old guy, an old retired man, just stretching his very long legs. He was about this tall. And uh, he, uh, he would say, he just say to people, how are you going? Feeling a bit troubled? Come and have a cup of tea. He saved so many lives. So, you know, there's a role for all of us in the area of mental illness. Uh, in terms of the resources that we're putting into it, they're unprecedented. Uh, you mentioned suicide. We have suicide prevention trials going on right around the country. We've just extended them for another year because we're trialling them in urban areas, we're trialling them in areas where there's a large veterans community, we're trialling them in remote areas, in areas where there's a large indigenous uh, population because we're trying to find the techniques that work best and working very close, closely with uh, the experts you know, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this was a great budget 
both for aged care, I mentioned that earlier, but also for mental health, so more resources going into it. Now, you mentioned uh, some very, uh, some practices that you talked about in uh, hospitals and mental health, uh, psychiatric wards. If you've got instances of, of you know, wrongdoing like that, you should let us know because we'll make sure they're properly investigated. But believe me, I am committed to, to advancing the mental wealth of our nation because we all have a vested interest in everybody else's mental health. Thank you very much, Jessica. And um, as the Prime Minister said, um, across Western Sydney, uh, this is a, a very important and serious issue. I know it takes guts to say some of the things that you said tonight, particularly to talk about a friend. Uh, and uh, if there is uh, anything that you would like us to follow up from my perspective, uh, then I'm very, very happy to do that. And some of my team are here with me tonight. The gentleman over here. Sorry, can you just wait for the microphone, Mark, one yeah. second, so that everyone yeah. can hear you? Sure, sorry. Um, Prime Minister, my question's around the National Rental Affordability Scheme. Um, that scheme's been in play for a while now, and it's coming to an end. And uh, it, what it does, it, obviously, it, it provides rental accommodation at 75% of market rent. Mm. Um, as that scheme diminishes in the next couple of years, rental income or rental uh, properties will actually revert to full market rents. What does your government or what is your government intended to do to try and assist people on low incomes to afford um, rental accommodation such as in Penrith? Yeah, well, thank, thank you very much for that. Housing affordability is a big priority of ours and we're obviously working closely with the states uh, on that, on all of these measures, uh, including obviously the, all of the housing agreements that we have with them. So that's a big part of it. I'd look really, are you involved in the property sector yourself? Yeah. Well, you, you know you're getting support from some of our existing programs and I'd, we'd like to talk to you uh, further about how we can do more. One of the most important things is to make sure, you, you've got to, ex, you know, you have to experiment a bit in public policy because not all, the, most, uh, well I'd say, I'd say all, let's assume, let's be benevolent tonight, all government policies are well intended but not all of them work as well as, as each other. And so uh, your feedback will be uh, really important. So we'll look forward, to, maybe you can have a chat after this, go into some more detail about what you see the shortcomings, if any of NRAS are, how it can be improved and modified in the future. Thank you. While we're talking about cost of living, Prime Minister, there is a question from uh, Catherine on uh, your Facebook live stream, which asks, what are we doing about electricity prices? We might uh, ask you to respond to question. that, and then we'll go back to the audience. Right, well, that's great. I'm so glad. Catherine, good question. Look, one of the biggest uh, pressures on households, on businesses, on everybody, has been the rising cost of energy, particularly the rising cost of electricity. It has been, it's a problem that took, has been taken quite a while to create. There have been a lot of failures in policy and we are correcting them one after the other. Uh, we have the overall policy we have, which for the first time brings together climate policy and energy policy is called the National Energy Guarantee. That will result, don't take my word for it, take the Energy Security Board's word for it, that will result in a 23% reduction in wholesale energy costs. That's the cost of, essentially, the cost of generation uh, over the decade to 2030 after it's introduced. We've taken action, pretty uh, de decisive action actually, to, uh, to bring down the price of gas. We got, again, talk about mistakes taking a long time. For reasons I cannot explain to you, in, in 2012 or thereabouts, a, was a Queensland state Labor government and a federal Labor government agreed to the exporting of gas from the East Coast. And this was on the back of the coal seam gas, uh, you know, revolution, if you like, or development in Queensland. And they built, allowed these big export terminals to be built. Fair enough. Apparently, despite warnings to be wary from the energy department, from the regulators, from the industry, from manufacturers in particular, 
no measures were taken to protect the domestic gas market because the East Coast market had never had exports from it before. It had been the, all the exports of gas from Australia had gone from, from Western Australia, from the Northwest Shelf, essentially. And so we had, a year, a year or so ago, we had a situation where we had a serious shortage of gas on the East Coast, and the price of gas being wholesale price on the, here in, you know, in Sydney and Melbourne and so forth, was getting up to twice the price that our gas was being sold for, say, to Japan or Korea. It was, it was crazy, absolutely crazy. I got to the point, which was an unlikely position for a Liberal Prime Minister, I have to say, where I was, uh, we established the powers to uh, limit exports. Now, you know, that is, that's a very heavy-handed regulation. It's not something I could ever have imagined I would find myself doing, but we had to get the industry to recognise that they had to produce enough gas for our East Coast demands. Now, what's happened is that more gas has come on stream, the industry has been very cooperative, and we now have seen gas prices coming back down again. That's had an impact on electricity prices. We've also had uh, the problems with uh, some, it, particularly in South Australia, less of an issue here in New South Wales, but you've had in some states a really, um, a really mindless rush into renewable energy. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a big believer in renewables. I think the cost of you know, solar in particular is going to keep on coming down, and you can, as you know, we are going to build with Snowy Hydro 2.0 what will be the largest battery uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, one of the largest in the world, which will support uh, renewables like wind and solar. But in, in some states, in particular in uh, South Australia, they got to the point where they had so much wind that on one day, from one hour, the wind could generate 125% of the state's demand for electricity. And then when the wind dropped, 0%. How does that work? No storage, no backup, no plan, just a long extension cord into Victoria. You got, it was, I described it as a combination of ideology and idiocy. Because it's one thing to say, I want to have my electricity, you know, all renewable and green, fair enough, but that's what you want to do. But you've got to at least plan so that people can keep the lights on. You've got to be able to keep the lights on. So, we, so what we're doing is ensuring that we take a hard-headed, business-like approach to energy, which will ensure that energy is more affordable and reliable. We've got to be able to keep the lights on and be able to afford to keep them on. Now, the threat to that is obviously from the Labor Party, who still see, and the Greens, who still see this energy issue as one that is all about ideology and, uh, you know, and virtue signalling and saying, you know, renewables good, coal bad, renewables good, you know, solar good, gas bad. You know what? None of these forms of generation have got any moral characteristics at all. They're neither good nor bad, they have certain physical characteristics. And what you've got to do is have the right mix and the right plan that enables you to have energy which is affordable and reliable and, of course, meet whatever emissions targets you've contracted to enter to do or you've agreed to, as we have with the Paris Agreement, 26 to 28 per cent by 2030. Now, that's, our, that's, that's the agreement we've entered into. Labor wants to unilaterally increase that to 45 per cent. Why would you do? Well, thank you. I understand, I understand the, the, your sentiments, but I can just say to you, why would you unilaterally, in a global agreement, agree to increase the economic burden on Australia without getting any comparable commitment yeah. from other countries? So, you know, I I'm, 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 I'm take a very business-like approach to this. We'll meet our international commitments, we'll keep the lights on, and we'll make sure Australians can afford to pay to keep them on. There's a young gentleman just there who's had his hand up for quite some time. Can you just wait for the microphone for me, please? It's right behind you. No, turn to your other... There you go. Yes. <laughs> Secretly coming from the other direction. It's on. Just okay. if you just speak into it. Uh, as a Muslim, I'd like to know how you plan on uh, tackling radical Islamic ideology and terrorism, as well as practices such as misogyny, 
domestic abuse and forced marriages in the Muslim community. Well, how, how would you, you, if you said you're a young Muslim, how would you suggest we should do it? I, I want to know how the government would do it. Yeah, as well, well as how you plan on reducing well, immigration from um, Muslim majority countries which have practices incompatible with the West. Sorry, just stay, uh, do the last bit again. How you plan on reducing immigration from countries that have yeah. practices incompatible with the West? Well, well, okay, let me deal first with, with immigration. We have a non-discriminatory immigration program, number one. Uh, number two, uh, our immigration program is run in the interests of one nation and one nation only, and that's Australia. So it's designed to support our national interest. And our commitment as a government, my commitment as Prime Minister, is to say to you that we will continue to ensure that nobody comes to Australia, whether temporarily or as a permanent resident, other than with the consent of the government of Australia. We will not outsource our immigration program to people smugglers as the Labor Party did. We will not do that. Now, in terms of, uh, in terms of radicalism, uh, it is very important, and I, let's talk about a current example. It's very important, I think, for leaders in the Muslim community, whether they're young people like yourself or older people or, or you know, leaders of governments, to be able to say, as President Joko Widodo of Indonesia does, and remember he's the democratically elected president of the largest majority Muslim country in the world by quite a long way, and it's our closest neighbor. And President Jokowi always says, Indonesia proves that Islam is compatible with democracy and with moderation and tolerance. And that is why, of course, the Indonesia is so appalled by the shocking terrorist attack, uh, attacks, I should say, in Surabaya just in the last 24 hours. Uh, so it's very important for uh, those points to be made and that leadership to be shown in the Islamic community. But I can say from the point of view of the Australian government, there is only one law that applies in Australia and that is Australian law. That is the law of Australia legislated by Australian parliaments enforced by Australian courts. There is only one body that determines who comes to Australia, and that is the Australian government. Full stop. Whether it is through the humanitarian program, whether it's through, whether it's people on a tourist visa, whether it is students, whether it is temporary skilled migrants, whether it is permanent migrants, it is only the Australian government that determines who come here, comes here, and the immigration program is run in our national interest, our national interest alone. You know, there's been talk about the, uh, you know, there being a, a, uh, a number of 190,000 permanent migrants a year. Let me tell you, that is not a target. That is a ceiling. We, we've, we came under that a year or so ago. I've got, I expect we'll come under it this year as well. The, po the point of the permanent migration program is to, one, uh, ensure that Australians who go overseas and marry foreigners are able to come home with their husbands or wives, as the case may be. That's, that's about a third of it. And the other third of it is skilled. But those have to be people whose skills are of real value to Australia. And, you know, you would know from, I'm not sure there are many people here that fall into that category, and certainly uh, you, you meet them here right around Australia. We've got, we have to continue to be a skills magnet. We want to get as much talent here, but it's got to be talent we need, and it's got to be talent that supports our economy, and of course, supports the growth of more jobs and more training here in Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take two or three more questions from the room. We'll wrap up with one from Facebook. Uh, question over there at the back. I can't, you're right behind that camera. I can't see you, that young man there. Wait for the mic. Yes, thank you. Hi, Malcolm. Uh, my name's Angus. I'm uh, from the University of Wollongong, and I'm actually a member of the uh, UOW Liberal Club. Um, my question is based around um, the emphasis that has been placed on the budget 
um, that it helps um, the older members of Australia. So my question was, um, what specifically is in the budget that helps the youth of Australia? Greater opportunities to get a job, greater opportunities to get on and realise your dreams. The best thing, Angus, for you, the absolutely best thing. How old are you, Angus? Um, 29, 22. Who, who here would like to be 19 again? Lots. <laughs> Fantastic. Angus, you've got your whole life ahead of you. And what you need is, the, what you need is an economy that has as much opportunity for you to realise your dreams. You don't, by, by, by the time you're my age, who knows what you'll be doing? You might be Prime Minister yourself, standing here in the peachy, giving it to politics in the pub. But you can do anything. But what you need is the greatest opportunities. And so that stronger economic growth is the key to all of your opportunity and your aspirations. And of course, it doesn't hurt to have lower tax. I mean, when you get to be earning over $200,000, if you do, you'll pay 45 cents plus the Medicare levy. But until then, isn't it good to know that you be, won't be paying more than 32 and a half cents in the dollar by the time you're starting to earn more and get ahead and, you know, having a go? So, Angus, look, you're 19 years of age. You're an Australian. You've, you've won the, you know, the lottery ticket of life in uh, being an Australian. It's the best country in the world. And I know that with the values that we share backing enterprise, you and your generation will make this an even greater country in the decades ahead. So congratulations, Angus, and thanks for coming up from Wollongong. Gentlemen there. This gentleman over here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, I'm a Penrith local resident. Um, two things I'd like to discuss, and you've already pointed out some of the things with your energy policy, but nowhere in the energy policy or in anybody's energy policy do I ever hear about um, nuclear energy. Good question. Okay. Um, this country has a, a resource, yellow cake, that we don't use, and I believe that the safety of nuclear energy is now much better than it was even five years ago. So I, I, I think to have clean, green energy, it must glow yellow. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and and my, my second point is... As, uh, as opposed to the green that it glows in The Simpsons. You know? Correct. <laughs> um, and my second point is international trade and our uh, defence affiliations with um, places like the United States, which is uh, long running. Um, I've had a number of dealings with China, I've done business in China a number of times and I just feel that um, as, as a country as a whole we could sell to China and, and have a much, much better relationship, trading relationship with China if we were to, I, I don't know what the terminology you would use, cosy to them I suppose is, is what I'm getting at, um, to, to it would be much more prosperous for Australia and for all of us, I believe. Your thoughts? Okay, okay. right. Well, well, look, let me, let's run through them. Uh, nuclear power, uh, obviously, it has, uh, you know, the, you know ma the political and environmental obstacles are gigantic. Uh, I, I don't, my crystal ball is as cloudy as, as anyone's you're talking about uh, some of these issues. But I'd have to say that I think in Australia, given that we do not have rapidly rising demand for energy, you know, where our energy demand is, is fairly flat uh, and is likely to be, even notwithstanding our growing population, I would be very surprised if, if even assuming the political and environmental issues could be dealt with, which is a huge assumption, I'd be very surprised if uh, nuclear power, at least in the current technologies that are available, uh, stacked up economically. I'd be very doubtful about that. The, where you've seen the, the big uh, game changer in terms of technology has been in the reduction in the cost of solar energy in particular. 
uh, photovoltaics in particular. The cost keeps on coming down. A, a lot of it with Australian technology, I might say, uh, mostly developed at the University of New South Wales. Well, there's very good material science at the University of Wollongong, Angus, so <laughs> should be, there's a lot of great science here in Australia that's adding to that. Uh, the, uh, and of course, then you've got the question, obviously the sun doesn't shine all the time, so what do you do with storage? Uh, well, how do you back it up? Well, we've got, we've got an enormous amount of gas in Australia, despite the issues I referred to earlier. Gas is a great peaking fuel, and of course, you've got now the growing technology of batteries, and then you've got pumped hydro. Uh, so the, uh, uh, I, I, you know, just as a, as, a, as, a, as a businessman rather than a politician, I would say I'd be, I'd be, I'd be skeptical that, that nuclear, unless there is a big change in attitudes, political, environmental attitudes, I'd be doubtful if it would stack up. In terms of trade, uh, Look, we have a huge trading relationship with China. Uh, we do disagree on some issues from time to time, but the relationship is very strong. It's built on much more than just trade, of course. You know, there are over a million Australians of Chinese ancestry, including my granddaughter, uh, or one of my two granddaughters. So, you know, I think uh, we've got, uh, that relationship will steam ahead, but clearly our alliance and our relationship with the United States is, uh, you know, is, is unique, both in its significance from a defence point of view, and Maurice understands that probably better than any of us here tonight, but also in terms of shared values and history. So, you know, we have a great ally in Washington, and we have a good friend and uh, trading partner, and in a sense, family uh, uh, relation too in Beijing. I'm going to take one more from the floor, the lady with the dark hair there and the glasses on her head. You, that's you, yes. Uh, and then I'm going to take uh, us, Prime Minister, to wrap up with one from Facebook and then you'll have a little bit of time to circulate so you can ask your own questions as well. Good evening, Mr Turnbull. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Stephanie. Um, I'm an immigrant as well. Um, uh, I had the dubious pleasure of working in the UK during the global financial crisis for an investment bank and I saw firsthand the bad behaviour that caused the global financial crisis. Um, and saw the impact as well on friends and family. So we're going through the Banking Royal Commission now. Um, my question is twofold. So one is, what are you actually going to do at the end of the commission to, uh, to change banking behaviour? And what are you going to do to protect Australians from this bad behaviour as well? Mm. Well, thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, look, when the, the sort of the inflection point for me in this area was in 2016, a little over two years ago, uh, when some uh, misconduct by uh, Westpac uh, uh, was, became very public. And of course there'd been plenty of other cases beforehand. And I gave a speech in which I, I said that there had been a failure uh, in the culture of these banks and finance, many other financial services companies and, and, and it, was, it, was, it was simple and complex both at the same time. It was complex because, as you know, that industry is complex, you've worked in it. But it was simple in this sense, that what was not being done was putting the customer first. It's like a doctor, you know, a doctor has to put his or her patient first, a lawyer has to put his or her client first, a banker or a financial advisor has to put their customer, their client, whatever however you want to describe the counterparty, you've got to put them first. And that was the failure. That, and when you cut through all of these cases, you know, all of the examples are different one from the other, but that is the thread. It's not a golden thread, it's a black thread that runs right through it all. And that's what I called out. Now what we started doing then was putting in place the changes to regulation and to the law to ensure that financial institutions did put customers first. It's a, quite a long list. I'll just deal with a couple of them. We introduced a banking executive accountability regime, which basically means that banking executives that do the wrong thing may find themselves having to find another, quite a different industry to work in. Pretty tough stuff. Big fines, very serious consequences. We've established, and it's, 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 it's about to commence business, in fact, a new one-stop shop to deal with customer complaints and 
uh, you know, business complaints up to $5 million, uh, you know, matters, loans and so forth, uh, consumer complaints and, say, small business complaints, that can give quick justice, uh, ensure that uh, compensation is paid, that recompense is paid, but not with all of the horror and cost of going, you know, to the Supreme Court or the District Court. Uh, we've also given the regulator, ASIC, more resources, both in terms of legal powers and in terms of uh, financial resources, and a lot of other things too. So, so we've put all those measures in place, and now we have the Royal Commission. Uh, we've asked the Royal Commission, among other things, to look at what we've done, basically to say, you know, tell us whether you think there's more we should do, or you know, whether we should do it, do things differently. Uh, and uh, they will, and the Royal Commissioner will do that in due course and will obviously take, you know, I imagine we will adopt the recommendations that are made or certainly that would be uh, the, the, the standard uh, response. Uh, look, I guess the important thing, the important thing is we did not sit on our hands. We moved on it quickly. And I mean, obviously, you know, I've been, have, I, I take responsibility for not calling a Royal Commission two years ago. I'll tell you frankly why I didn't, because I wanted to get on with the task of reform immediately. My concern was if I'd called a Royal Commission in 2016, you know, it might be just about wrapping up now and then you'd be looking at the recommendations and working out what to do. So it may be that for uh, whatever the political implications were and the criticism, it may be that we've got a good outcome uh, because we've got ref major reforms have been introduced and are up and running. People are definitely safer today. Uh, and we also have a Royal Commission that is able to review that and provide us with advice on you know, how to improve it. So uh, that's, that's where we are. But, but look, I, I've, I, I really, like you, I really understand what has gone wrong. Not in the intricacy of every matter, but fundamentally, it's a question of integrity and trust. Are you putting your customer first? That's what it's all about. Are you putting, are you treating your customer as though he or she is the only person whose interest you should be protecting? That's the, that is the important thing. And uh, as, long as, as long as we can achieve that change of culture, obviously mistakes will still be made. People will, you know, People will give advice in good faith that turns out to be wrong, no doubt, but you won't get this, this uh, betrayal of people's interest by advisors who should have known better. That's the hard part of changing the culture. And it I've is. seen that, I've tried to be involved in that, and that is, it's huge. It is, you're right. And, and you know, Stephanie, the only way you change culture is through leadership. And, what, and I, I'll, I'll give, conclude on this with just these two observations. Number one. We are determined to ensure that this wrongdoing never happens again. That's one. Number two, we are determined to ensure that those who have done the wrong thing are held to account. That is critically important. People have to understand that there are consequences. If you betray your client's trust, if you, be if you put the customer's interest behind your own, then there will be a consequence, a price to pay. So, PM, there's a lot of questions still in the crowd, and uh, I know you've got a little bit of a short yeah, amount of time well, to circulate uh, when we finish. But there is a good, I think, wrap-up question, which will, uh, which comes from Facebook, but also uh, reflect the interests of a lot of people in here. Because I know that we have. Uh, across the Western Sydney region, from the south, from Camden and Campbelltown, the Wallandilly area, the north, the Hawkesbury, and I know we have a couple of our councillors from Hawkesbury here. Mm. Penrith uh, councillors, maybe, if, uh, if Mr Cartwright is elected, uh, also in the room. Any There's Turnbulls some from Portland Head here? Any Turnbulls from Portland Head. <laughs> um, there is some interest about the Western Sydney City deal, Prime Minister, which, yeah. as you know, for the Commonwealth, the state, yeah. and eight local governments uh, in this yeah. part of the world, was a groundbreaking uh, initiative for yeah. cooperation in planning and in so many other things. Uh, can you talk briefly to us, and then we'll go to um, one to uh, uh, talking around the room uh, about the Western Sydney City deal and and its potential for this part of Sydney? Okay. Well, thank you, Maurice. Look, this is uh, the fastest growing part of Australia. 
right here, and you know that. You understand, and you understand better than anybody, the consequences of growth which has not been properly planned, of growth where the infrastructure has not been put in place or planned in advance. We have to get back to the point where we are planning our infrastructure, whether it is roads or rail, whether it is schools, whether it is parks, whether it is sporting facilities, in advance. You can't, we cannot keep on allowing development and then when thousands of people have moved into an area say, good gosh, there's no, there's no transport. There aren't any schools. How are people going to get around? How did this happen? Well, it only happens because you don't plan. So I was determined when I became Prime Minister to change the way the federal government worked with state and local governments. Historically, federal, state and local governments have been like ships passing in the night. More often than not, they've been heading in broadly the same direction, but they have, sometimes they haven't, by the way, but uh, they have not, certainly weren't communicating. You know, we don't have enough resources to not work together. So the way the city deals work, and the way it works in Western Sydney, is we agree, as a federal government, state government, and local governments, eight local governments, what we're trying to achieve. And that is a fantastic parkland city here. You know, the fantastic, fantastic city in Western Sydney, and, and it is one that has got jobs, that's got amenity, that is literally the 30-minute city that, that Lucy talks about a lot as... as well, well, you know, I hear you, I hear the... I, I hear the concerns about it, but let me, just, let me just say to you, the only way you achieve the greater amenity is by planning. And what we're doing is ensuring that we have that planning and we're putting in place the measures to do that and so we've got, whether it is the Western Sydney Airport, the North-South Rail Link, whether I understand there are some opponents to the airport here, we've spoken earlier, but the important thing is to plan, because you can't get into a situation where you have most of the working population leaving Western Sydney to go to work every day. A 30-minute city, by the way, doesn't mean you can get, you know, from Penrith to Cronulla in 30 minutes. What it means is that wherever you live in a city, there are opportunities for employment, a range of employment opportunities, education, recreation, so forth, cultural opportunities, cultural institutions. You've got to make sure that that is available within that accessible range. I think this is a big, well, I know this is a revolution in the way the federal government approaches these things, and I want to say how grateful I am for the cooperation of the state government, uh, the Premier Gladys Berejiklian and all her agencies, all of the local government uh, leaders here in Western Sydney, because we are determined to work together to make sure that the mistakes that were made in the past are not made again, and that planning ensures that you have the, uh, the livability and the amenity that a great city is entitled to. So that's what the City Deals is all Thank about, you. working together cooperation in the public interest. So thank you very much, Prime Minister. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to may I ask you to thank our hosts here at the Peach Tree. Can I ask you to thank our hosts here at the Peach Tree or the Peachy Alex, Colin Paris and the team here. Can I thank you all very much for coming? Can I can I promise you that a number of my cabinet colleagues will be joining us in the coming months for politics in the pub uh, at the Peachy and elsewhere. I look forward to inviting you more, of, more of you to join us on those occasions. And Prime Minister, there's some more pressing questions out there that 